a neglected landscape, a rural wasteland. And in the middle of it, this. The entrance to a mysterious underground station. There's nothing here but trees and bushes within a two kilometer radius. So why on earth is there an underground station in this deserted place? We travel to Chongqing in China. Only 20 kilometers away from the mysterious underground station, it looks like this. A gigantic metropolis. With an area of 82,000 square meters, Chongqing is the largest city in the world. But the route to the mysterious underground station is very lonely and bumpy. Station entrance. The entrance definitely isn't accessible by car. The road ends abruptly. From here on, it's only possible to walk through the middle of an overgrown landscape. About 250 meters further on, we find the site we're looking for. The underground station in the middle of nowhere. How can people get inside of here? The entrance is surrounded by a wall and closed by a rolling grill. Obviously, you aren't supposed to be able to enter this station at all. We can't find any other way in. Now and then, we see people in this remote area. What are they doing here in the middle of nowhere? Normally, only farmers pass through here. This is a very deserted area. But why do farmers need an underground station? We continue to fight our way through the bushes to the other entrance of the station and find this lift. It seems to belong to the underground station, but it's completely run down. Cables are hanging out. The windows aren't in the best condition. But we can't get in here either. Our team, however, discovers an interesting detail. The lift has no power. Yeah, but the elevator seems like from Germany. Such a lift costs around 100,000 euros. Why put so much money into an underground station that's not in use? Then we meet some tourists. We want to see the loneliest underground station in the world. Yeah, it's a great travel destination. Student Zheng Wei Chong also lives nearby. But so far, she only knows this place from social media. She shows us the east entrance, but unfortunately, it's also locked. I've driven through this underground station before, but I was never aware that the exit looked like this. I know these abandoned stations of Chongqing from the internet, but today's the first time I've actually been here because it's very deserted out here. Zheng Hui Chong thinks we may have better luck at the west entrance. And indeed, no bars. Even the escalators work. Everything looks quite new. At the entrance, we even meet a security guard. But he won't give us an interview. Turn off the camera, please. One floor below, this lonely underground station even has functioning ticket machines and security barriers. Even the trains are running every five minutes. But nobody gets off. To find out why there's a fully functioning underground station in the middle of a wasteland, we have arranged an interview with a construction expert. Leo Zhu is in charge of large government building projects and can explain to us what the lonely underground station is all about. First, a good infrastructure is needed, i.e. roads and underground railways, before the city can be developed. Chongqing is currently growing northwards, towards Lijia, where the city is now being built around the existing underground stations. 
This is a strategic point for Chongqing's development. One million people move to Chongqing every year. Therefore, the city is building like crazy. 130,000 square meters are built here every day. To ensure that the infrastructure doesn't come to a standstill, the metro is built in advance. At the moment, the network is 213 kilometers long. In 10 years, it's expected to be around 800. So, the city first builds the metro and then the houses. What seems crazy at first glance is very clever in the long run. This may now be the loneliest metro station in the world. However, in just a few years' time, it will be one of the busiest. Riding the subway in Russia, usually a real experience. Moscow, for example, has one of the largest, most effective and beautiful subway systems in the world. Every minute the metro passes below Russia's megacity, like clockwork. But this isn't the case everywhere. Wow, man! The metro in Omsk, Siberia, is one of those cases. Broken tunnels, ice and darkness. But why has this metro never been used? And why does it look so run down here? That's just... what are we walking on? Look at this! The only way to find out how it came to this is by flying to Omsk, a city of just over a million, two and a half thousand kilometers east of Moscow. In the middle of the Siberian metropolis, our reporter Nico discovers this sign. Well, this certainly looks like a normal subway entrance, I'd say. And even further down, everything seems quite normal, just like a normal subway station. But then, suddenly... Yeah. And now... There's just a wall. The entrance to this metro stop is blocked. Behind this wall there should be the stop Pushkin Library, a subway station with possible interchanges with long corridors and nice marble facing. Trains are supposed to depart here every five minutes, supposed to being the operative word. Because nothing is running here yet. Instead, we meet street musicians who sing the praises of Omsk and its subway, ironically. I still believe the metro will come. Yes, we believe that it exists and that it will come. It is of course sad that it doesn't work as a metro, but at least we have an underground passageway. It's a nice place. Do you know of any way or means of getting down to the actual subway? We know some guys who go down there and take pictures underground, but you shouldn't do that. We wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> this looks anything but accessible. The center of the city is just one big idle construction site with half-finished stops. Everything is closed off. I'd love to go down there. We want to know why this mega project was simply abandoned and ask the city planning office for an interview, but they refuse. And we can't find any construction workers we could ask. So we arranged to meet the former chief engineer of the Omsk subway, Edward Safronov. For him, every visit here is painful. It's a bad feeling. We've been building this object and the Omsk metro for more than 30 years. Our regional government decides such issues. If someone new comes along, they forget all the projects that were promised before. Edward Safranov had just graduated from university when he was assigned this job. Today he's 72 and retired. 
Corruption and various financial crises have thwarted the city's plans for years. And so the Metro Bridge is a sinfully expensive symbol of failure. Approximately 250 million euros have been wasted on the metro so far. In secret, the people of Omsk are saying that it might be three times as much. Officially, the subway is still under construction. Is that really the case? Could the tunnel still be used? We arrange to meet a so-called digger who offers tours through Omsk's underworld on the internet. Not illegal, but technically not legal either. Therefore, we don't meet until midnight. Hi, which way? Down the steps. Even in the centre of the big city, hardly anyone is on the road at this hour. Except, of course, underground fans. First stop, a shaft directly on a main road. I'm getting the impression it's all medium safe. This is not all stable. I checked. Oops. Something's breaking off. No idea what. Enter at your own risk. Nobody supervises or controls the construction site. Just let me get my leg in. This is crazy. Look at that ladder there. A six meter descent on a wooden slat. Fortunately, this section is the only shaky descent, because just a few meters further on, we reach the subway tunnels of Osk. A world of tubes, water and ice, dark and deserted. Only diggers like Sergei come down here regularly. Are there many people who do this? A few people. Most diggers are photographers. They enjoy the atmosphere and take a few pictures. Sergei has been here about 20 times with his camera. He posts his photos online or sells them to earn a bit of money. To be on the safe side, he always has a self-made plan of the construction site with him. Almost 8 kilometers of tunnel and rail network have already been built and have simply been left to rot. Damp walls, garbage and rust. Where there was supposed to be an operating subway, a lot of money is now being spent just to make sure nothing collapses. Look, they just put that thing up a week ago. It measures whether the walls are tilting. So far, it's at zero, so everything's fine. Ah, so we can carry on then. Then Sergei leads us to the subway bridge. Below us, the river. Above us, cars. That really sounds like there's a train coming. I'm getting a bit scared, but I don't think there'll be any trains today. We are kind of in the belly of the one and a half kilometer bridge over the river Irtish, which we visited during the day. A central part of a network that was originally supposed to look like this. The bridge was supposed to be part of the red line. A total of four lines were planned. Tunnels had already been ducked to the airport as well. Subway lines and station names had already been determined by the city. 80 million people were supposed to be able to use the metro every year. Today, we are the only visitors here. Sergei says that sometimes you meet other curious people. The tour is not officially allowed, but it is not really forbidden either. And if you do risk going down, in some places you will find yourself in an ice cave. That's just... What are we walking on? Just look at this. Oh shit, it's moving. Right now it's spring and the ice underneath the Siberian city is beginning to melt. It's even getting too unsafe now for our guide. This is where it ends.
though the next surprise is waiting next to this tunnel. Wow, man! A subterranean lagoon. The water here is meters deep. In order to keep the whole construction reasonably stable, the corridors have to be maintained regularly. To avoid having to swim, the workers responsibly have built themselves a wooden bridge. But where does it all go from here? There was the idea of turning this into an underground car park, but nothing came of it, and now it just needs to be maintained somehow. Hundreds of millions of euros were spent on the metro in Omsk, all for nothing. For us, after three hours underground, we finally go up again and out of the metro, which will probably never be finished. Engineer Edward Safranov, who led the subway project decades ago, hopes that at least parts of it can be put to good use. Since 2014, we've been planning a light rail network here for a streetcar or something like that. 80 kilometers that run along the city's main roads. But even that idea is currently not being pursued. One last time we go and see the only completed subway entrance, because a special event is planned here today. An art project is being created here. For the next two years, the M project exhibition is to make this passageway more attractive and enable local residents to enjoy the artwork. What is the story behind this spooky training hall? There isn't a single window and the entrance is through a compressed airlock. And what secret is hidden in this North German moor? What lies below the ground in waist-deep water? Jan Schwiderek explores these lost places. Our first stop is in the east of Berlin. In the middle of the forest at a place called Kienbaum, the GDR's elite athletes trained before the fall of the wall. What hardly anyone knew, they even went underground. I'm standing here in the former GDR's most secret sports hall, located in a bunker underground, but nevertheless, it went up to 4,000 meters in altitude. That doesn't sound very logical, but it's true. The lost place is located right next to a hypermodern sports complex, now called the Bundesleistungszentrum Kienbaum, the national training center. Germany's best athletes prepare for their competitions here at this. Most of them have no idea what kind of forgotten place is just a few meters away from them. This is where it's supposed to go several thousand meters up. Jan is curious. Hello, Mr. Novak. Very warm welcome. Klaus-Peter Novak is the National Training Center's managing director. He leads Jan into a world in which time seems to have stood still. Where are we exactly? This is the GDR's former high-altitude training facility, where they could simulate training up to a maximum altitude of 4,000 meters. The way into the Holy of Holies of GDR sport leads through an airlock. Up to this small room, the pressure was normal. But behind the two airtight steel doors, the high-altitude mountain range began. In the form of negative pressure. Wow! Is this the low-pressure vacuum chamber, Mr. Novak? Yes, there are concrete walls up to three meters thick in here at times. Epoxy resin was then poured over them, so that the air pressure could be maintained in here. So this is the solution to the mystery. The air was sucked out of this hall until the air pressure reached the same level it would be 3,000 meters above sea level. So the athletes could actually train at altitude on treadmills or specially constructed ergometers without having to travel to the mountains. Right, now start pedaling. So Jan Ulrich, for example, sat on this bike and did his training here, right? We know that he trained down here as a junior athlete. For 11 years, from 1979 to 1990, GDR athletes trained in this low-pressure chamber. 
There are no pictures from that time. Filming and taking photographs was strictly forbidden. But shortly after reunification, sports scientists put the facility back into operation. This is how these pictures came about. In GDR times, athletes went inside here for half or full days. To stop them getting bored, the coaches showed videos and played music for them. The tapes for this are still in the so-called control room right next door. What kind of music did they listen to? The athletes only listened to Western music. Now that was music that made you go faster. Andreas Dittmer also trained in the low-pressure chamber at the age of 17. The canoeist still remembers the lock process well. You have to imagine that it's like getting into a gondola that made quite a few meters in altitude relatively fast. And that puts pressure on your ears, on your eyes somehow. Do you feel it in your body? On your ears mainly. It's like taking off in a plane. You always have that feeling of pressure. And then it went up to altitude. Constructed because the GDR had neither its own mountains nor the money for training camps abroad. There was even an extra hall for the canoeists. What is it? This is the canoeing pool where we did our training sessions on the water. The basin has been dry for 25 years. But Andrea still knows exactly where his place was. As a Canadian singles canoeist, he trained on the outside. The kayakers, on the other hand, sat in the middle. The specially shaped paddle simulated water pressure on a moving boat. High altitude training is not doping. It works on a simple principle. Less air pressure means less oxygen. The organism feels the lack of it and reacts. It produces more red blood cells, the so-called erythrocytes. They transport the oxygen to the muscles. The more red blood cells there are, the more oxygen reaches the muscles. The result is a completely legal improvement in performance for athletes taking part in a competition afterwards. Go on, Andreas, quicker! How big the effect of the low-pressure chamber actually was on Andreas Dittmer's career is difficult to estimate. But it definitely didn't do him any harm. He was an eight-time Canadian singles world champion and won Olympic gold three times in a row. Our next lost place is in London near Husum, in the middle of the Schlichtinger Moor. Between fields, trees and bushes, a few bent pipes jut out into the landscape, along with strange concrete pedestals and mysterious dilapidated air shafts. At this very spot, 40 years ago, espionage was carried out. But not up here, down there. This man will take Jan underground. Uwe Purschke, former staff sergeant. From here he listened to the enemy in the east for over 20 years. He worked at the Direction Finding Centre North, whose antennas rose into the air in this place from 1967 to 1987. What did this antenna system look like in the 70s? Yes, there were two antenna circles. The inner one was 8 metres in diameter and the outer one 20 metres. With the help of these antennas, the men from the Marine Telecommunication Center 713 targeted radio communications in the East. The whole thing was, of course, top secret. Could one say that you were a spy? Yes, you could see it that way, because we were interested in what the other side was doing. And you can say, yes, we were spying on them. In order to find out how the so-called telecommunications reconnaissance worked, Jan now has to put on watertight clothes. The more water has seeped into the former military bunker. This walk will be a real adventure. Oh my god! My goodness! Step by step we go down into the past. Jan has to feel his way through the waist-high water with his feet. There's something on the floor here. Somehow there's a sharp table or something in the water. What is it? It's not one of ours. 
There are several more stumbling blocks lurking underwater, although the site was cleared by the German Navy in 1987. In the event of a military conflict, the bunker was built to be atom bomb proof. This is now the pressure lock for decontamination, and quite macabre. There's a shaft going through to the back, that's where casualties could be stored, a so-called morgue. But it was never used, no. The bunker was built in 1967. It was the time of the Cold War and the arms race between East and West. The fear of nuclear war was omnipresent. No wonder both sides wanted to know as much about the other as possible. The soldiers in this bunker had the task of finding out where the Warsaw Pact troops were. Working in six-hour shifts, they targeted enemy communications. Now we're coming into the workroom. This is where I usually sat. This is your old workroom, is it? That was the worktop, and the control panel and the display unit was on here. This is what the so-called visual radio direction finder looked like, which Uwe Purschke was using at the time. The Morse signals from enemy troops were picked up by the antennas and transmitted to the inside via cables. Then it was a matter of pinpointing the exact direction the signals were coming from. But to determine exactly where the radio messages were sent, the Navy needed a second reading. This came from the direction finding center south at Lake Constance. Wherever the bearings crossed had to be where the enemy was located. At the time, it was all top secret. Today, the bunker is a forgotten Cold War side that nature is only slowly reclaiming. The press calls him the daredevil photographer. He calls himself Dark Cyanide. His trademark, the mask. He doesn't want to be recognized. He's looking for places in New York most people don't know about. I get out of it, it's pretty much like adrenaline, just like the fact of just doing something dangerous, it's just pretty fun. And also like being like a few people that have ever been to a certain location, that's what it's all really about, is being there. Today he's taking us to one of these places, somewhere out in Queens, an old industrial area. Pretty much an abandoned warehouse where they used to store uh, air conditioning units. It's been abandoned for quite some time. I've been here for the first time about uh, at least like four years ago when I first found it. It's one of my favorite locations because of all the pillars down the middle and all the graffiti that's here as well. Dark Cyanide doesn't really seem like a superhero. Quite the opposite, in fact. The daredevil photographer is a somewhat chubby teenager named Chris, and he used to be a real couch potato. When I was 14, I used to play a lot of video games and just like sit home and just play all day long. And one day I just decided, you know, I got to do something with my life, something more productive. So I found uh, the photography hobby. So I just started doing that and eventually evolved into uh, exploring the city. Uh, it just, uh, it's something I like to do. It, you get the adrenaline rush, you get to learn uh, new places, the history behind it all. It's very fascinating. Chris was looking for a new view of his city. These days, he describes himself as an urban explorer. He pursues his hobby like a real-life video game with different levels, where he searches, explores and photographs hidden, forgotten places. Pretty much made my own little game of exploring the city. It's more of a finding new places uh, that most people haven't been to, photographing it, documenting it. It's just all about finding the history behind the place. The problem? As a rule, access to his favorite locations is prohibited. So he wears the face mask not only for the coolness factor, and he always carries special equipment with him on his excursions as well. For having a multi-tool, having like clippers so you can clip a wire or something, or having a small pocket knife as well. Just nothing too big, because it's illegal if you have it at a certain size, but something just to protect yourself against wild animals or anyone who's trying to do harm to you. Uh, face masks, is, you know, in case you have to like blend in the dark, people won't see your face uh, and cameras as well. 
gloves is an essential as well. Protects your hands and it's also good grip for climbing. And an urban explorer has to climb, especially in Manhattan. For years, he took photographs from the rooftops of the skyscrapers in the financial districts. But rooftopping has now really come into fashion. Chris was constantly bumping into someone up there taking a selfie of his shoes. Well, over the years, it's been very hard to access many of the rooftops because so many people have done it. And they eventually just end up making the area hot that they eventually just shut down the area, especially the rooftops. Because this is not something you should try yourself. It is extremely dangerous and, of course, forbidden. Forbidden like this nocturnal expedition into the New York underground. And this time, Chris is taking a video camera with him as well. He never goes down there alone, always with a team. We're not destroying property, we're not vandalizing anything. We're just there just to take pictures, just to photograph the architecture of the tunnel, everything that's there. The urban explorer routes go through busy subway tunnels. Walking around here is a high voltage affair, and this is to be taken literally. Some of the recordings Chris takes on these expeditions are really well planned and look like artistic impressions from a strange world. I just like to take an actual shot and document the actual landscape of what I'm actually taking, because, you know, in 20 years, the whole landscape is going to already change, and I could always, you could always go back and compare and be like, wow, that wasn't much of a difference. Giving them a whole new perspective of what they're looking at, it's... And yet, his perspective of New York clearly does not correspond to what others associate with the city. For Dark Cyanide, the city is comparable to the setting of a video game, and his favorite map is clearly below the surface. The feeling you get about being underground it's like, you're, it's like a different world down there. It's like you're separated from the city. It's peaceful, it's quiet. And you just know that there's a thousands of people walking above you and they don't know that you're down there. It's just like a cool feeling, you know? In addition to his fondness for the hidden world in the New York underground, Dark Cyanide has also developed a real fondness for the city's bridges. Today, he takes us to one of his favorite locations. Though he keeps to himself where the entrance to the upper floor is, it wouldn't be everybody's cup of tea anyway. I was pretty scared at first, just because I wasn't know what I was getting myself into. And then eventually I found out how easy it was getting over the first part. And when I got to the top, it was like, holy crap, this is pretty awesome, you know? It's like a cool view of the city, of Brooklyn, everything. It's like very, it's, like, you know, it's a unique view, you know? The same applies to bridges. Never do it alone. There's always a team of three to four people at a photo shoot like this. But soon, Chris won't have to engage in illegal activities of this kind anymore. His pictures have earned him a place in the photography program of the New York Film Academy. And he has another very interesting dream. I want to go to Europe, pretty much. I want to explore the tunnels over there. There's so, so much history behind all the tunnels in Europe. And there's just so much I want to see over there. It's like really uncharted territory for me. He'd definitely be busy there. Although New York still offers enough new territory for the daredevil photographer. <laughs>